Our Father, we exalt your name. We bow in adoration before your holy throne. We praise you, Lord, for who you are. We adore you, Lord, for who you are. We have gathered this evening in the name of Jesus to be instructed by you by your word and to be imparted by your spirit. Lord, I ask by your spirit that you guide us into all truth. Let the truth of your word be unveiled to your people. Let everyone be empowered by the truth and let everything that is not of you loses its grip over everyone under the sound of my voice. Because your word has gone forth in righteousness, it will not return void. You have declared that we shall know the truth, and the truth will make us free. Therefore, Lord, make your people free by the truth that is coming our way tonight. In the name of Jesus, let the yoke of sin be broken. Let the power of infirmities be destroyed. Let everything hindering your people from fulfilling their purpose in you be completely eliminated. Let Jesus be glorified in every life. Thank you, dear Father. Blessed be your holy name. And the saints of God in the house says the loudest, amen. Just let me welcome somebody to your right, to your left. Tell them you're welcome. You're welcome tonight. You're welcome in the name of Jesus. Please take your seats. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to welcome every one of us to church this evening. Praise the Lord. Last Thursday, we had um, a question and answer session. And I believed we were thoroughly blessed. But I found out that we, we had almost 12 questions left unanswered. Praise the Lord. And um, we concluded that it's ideal that we answer those questions. And if you are here, you still have any question, please, you can send it in. If we can answer them, we will do that. If not, we will postpone that one till the end of the month. That's the last Thursday of this month. Don't forget that our question and answer session will always be on the last Thursday of the month. But we have to do this because... Um, I scan through those questions and I see that there is need for us to address them because what brings us to a place of maturity is when the questions in our hearts are answered. You know, when you come to church on Sunday, we preach, you have no room to ask questions. When we come on Bible study days, we preach, you have no room to um, ask questions. And that's why we felt that it's ideal for us to have this opportunity to share our thoughts, ask questions so that we can provide biblical answers that will help us to become established in the truth. You say the truth that you do not understand will not profit you. It is the truth that you know, that you understand, and that you practice that will add value to your life. But you cannot practice the truth of God's word if you don't understand it. And I trust the Lord that as we 
answer the questions here tonight. God will give us understanding. Media, do you have those questions typed out already? If you have done that, let's... Okay. Say so if you have a problem and can't solve it, how can you justify your actions and how do we get blindfolded by our problems? If I understand this very well, the person who sent in this question is trying to find out what could make us or what can make us get to a point where we, are, we begin to justify our problems, justify our actions. And how do we get to that place that we find ourselves blindfolded by our problems? Yes, it's very simple. Yeah, this in this kingdom, as a child of God, you are not meant to focus on problems. Whatsoever you focus on is magnified in your sight. Whatsoever you focus on gets bigger in your sight. Not because the thing is bigger, but in your own sight, it gets bigger. And the more you focus on it, actually, that focus is an unconscious meditation on the problem. When you meditate on anything, that thing will become more real to you. And when they become more real, they stay in your consciousness. It stares at you face to face on a daily basis. And that is when you find yourself becoming emotional about it. And when you are emotional about it, you will begin to take steps in the flesh to address that problem and uh, that is how many of us multiply our problems without knowing it. You see, as the children of God, our focus should not be on our problem, our focus should be on what God says about the problem. When you find yourself having a problem, whether an health issue or financial challenge or marital crisis, whatsoever the problem is, your responsibility is to go into God's word and look at what the word of God is saying about that problem. When you look at what the word of God is saying about the problem, you sit down with that, you Think about it. That's why the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life unto which you are called. You see, that is where the fight is. The fight not to focus on your problem. Because whatever you focus on will determine your feeling, how you feel per time. So if you are depressed, it means one thing that you have been focusing on the problem. If you are constantly agitated, it means you have been focusing on the problem. But those who choose to focus on God's word, what God says about the problem, will find themselves being at peace in the midst of the problem. So if all you do is to focus on your problem, you are thinking about how to overcome it by yourself, Thinking about the consequences of the problem, the challenges that the problem is bringing to you, you are focusing on the pressure. Hear this. You will begin to do things in the flesh and you feel justified. For example, when people hurt you, people say things against you, which is not true. People twist your word and use it to blackmail you. It is very normal to be angry. But if you focus on that, 
you will be so angry that you will sin. And the Bible says, be angry, but do what? Sin not. Say, so don't let the sun go down on your anger. It means your anger is not meant to last from whatsoever time you started it till sunset. If you got angry by three afternoon, you must resolve that anger in your heart before seven. That means you are not permitted to sustain anger in your heart. Because the more you get angry, the more you devise evil. Angry people devises evil. And they will justify their action. Hear me. If the word of God does not justify what you do, and you try to justify it, you are in error. You are in error. You might be the one that is right, but you still suffer. Because you choose to follow the path of error instead of submitting to what the word of God says about the situation. Hear this. Every act, every action you carried out in the flesh will always have their consequence. Do you know why? The Bible says to be carnally minded is dead. That means every action you carry out in the flesh will catch up with you one day. We work against you somehow without you knowing it. This is me, oh. You said this is you with wrong attitude. You are doing what is wrong and you feel justified because of what you think they have done to you. It will count against you one day. Because somebody will also look at how you handle that issue and determine that that is who you are. And they may use it against you in a day that is very important. There are people I can recommend for a job. There are people I can't do what? I can't recommend for a job because I can't vouch for their integrity. I won't allow them to disgrace me because I have seen a couple of times that their integrity is questionable. Are you getting that? But I will see it and shut my eyes as if I didn't see. Some that I can correct, I will correct them. And if they justify it, I keep quiet. But I can't recommend them. Just imagine if everybody sees them like that, they will suffer. Because you always need somebody's recommendation for any height you desire to attain. Did you get that? So back to that question, the person should understand that you have no, if you, if you focus on the problem, you'll be blinded by the problem and you end up acting in the flesh. And that will end up um, compounding the problem instead of solving it. Praise the Lord. The next question. Is it right for a born-again child of God to live in sin and still believe that he or she will make heaven, even if the person is caught in the act? Is it right for a, a born-again child of God to live in sin? Hear this, church. No genuine born-again child of God can live in sin. Let's go back into the Bible. Let's start from Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, I think, verse 19 to 21. And then we jump to verse chapter 6 because it's a continuation. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By whose disobedience? One man. One man. Who was that one man? 
Adam. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made what? Who is that one man? Jesus. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But we are seen abounded, grace abounded much more. Verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, before we go to chapter 6, go back to that verse 19. Understand this, that Christianity is not a religion. Religion has messed up so many things has messed up people's mind. And that's why we need the knowledge of the truth. You see, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Have you seen an unbeliever who is very good, who will not drink, who will not commit immorality, who will not steal, who will not cheat anyone? Have you seen? Does that attitude qualify for them for heaven? No. No. Even though they, they are moral people, they are good. That's why in Romans chapter 5, let me show you something. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Let's see. Romans 5, 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7. Uh, this is where I'm looking for. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone will even dare to die. Now, give me from Good News Translation for clarity. He said, it is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may even be that someone might dare to die for a good person. Now, why is it that somebody will find it difficult to die for a righteous person, but some can offer to die for a good person? What is the difference between being righteous and being good that will make some people to be willing to die for a good person, but nobody is willing to die for a righteous person? The reason is this. The righteous man, not everybody knows him to be righteous. Because righteousness is not in, just in the display. It should be expressed physically, but not every righteous person is expressing their righteousness. They are righteous in the spirit, yet they are still falling into one temptation or the other. They are still committing one sin or the other. So nobody will be willing to die for them because they are not seen to be righteous. But a good man, they say, ah, that man is a good man. That woman is a good woman. He is generous. He is kind. He is, what else? Loving, supportive of everybody around them. The only thing is that he is not born again. But because of his goodness, some people can stick out their neck and stand for them because of the physical manifestation of goodness. So let's go back to what, where we are looking at. By the disobedience of one, the disobedience of Adam, all became sinners. From the moment a child is born, the child became a sinner. Because of the sin of Adam. Now, for everyone who genuinely accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, even when they are still falling into one sin or the other, their salvation is real, and they still have the hope of eternity with Christ, even though they are still falling into one sin or the other. Now, 
Let me point out that part of the question I said, can uh, living in sin, that somebody who is born again and still living in sin. Now let's go to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Don't forget, in the previous chapter 5, verse 20, I mean, verse 20, he said, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Now, now, let me ask you a question. We'll go back to that. We as physical parents, we as human beings, we unconsciously demonstrate grace to our loved ones when they are in error. For example, if you have a child that you know that this child, this is the age of five, at the age of five, he or she is not supposed um, to we at home, but he or she is still weighing on the bed. If you are like my mom, every hour he will be waking you up, come and we. Is that true? Because she wouldn't want you to we on bed. She will inconvenience her own sleep to help you not to wee on bed. Meanwhile, the ones that does not wee on bed, she needed no effort to handle that one. Now, let me use another illustration. For those who have had a child that have maybe one way or the other, they are wayward or they are addicted to drug or something, you see the parent will spend so much money on the child that is giving them problem, more than the ones that is not giving them problem. Is that true? When as a parent, you remember, this is my child. I can't allow him to be destroyed. I can't allow her to be destroyed. A great servant of God told me about a man of God, a very senior, well-known man of God in this country, that their first son is a drug addict. They've taken him overseas, spent so much money, there was no change. They had to bring him back to Nigeria. In fact, that was when I knew that there is a rehabilitation home here in Port Harcourt. They said they had to bring him from, because from Lagos, to the rehabilitation home in Port Harcourt, and they are paying one million per month to rehabilitate him. And he has been in that home for two years. Now, the other children that are not causing them anything, I doubt if they will give them one million pocket money per month. We are seeing abounds, grace much more abound. What does that mean? Grace at Tends much more to the people who are in error in order to help them overcome it. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is meant to help us to overcome sin. So when a genuinely born again child of God is sinning and the rest of you you are mocking them. You are looking down on them. God is looking at how to restore the person. Because you and I didn't die for anybody. So you don't know what it means when somebody is sleeping away from God. God will do everything to bring the person back. Jesus demonstrated this. When... They brought the woman caught in the very act of adultery. Remember, as they brought the woman, they said, the law of Moses said this, that anyone caught in the adultery should be stoned to death. Say, what do you think? They are asking grace. 
what he thinks. Jesus is grace personified. Jesus is the physical expression of the grace of God. So they asked him, what do you think? And he started writing on the floor. And he said, he, without sin among you, cast the first stone. Because all of them has one thing or the other, they are covering under themselves. You see, people who talk too much about other people's sin have a lot under their clothes. They, they, they talk about other people's sin and shortcomings to make them feel a little bit good about themselves. Because they're, me, I'm still better than this one. Let me tell you something. Hear this, hear this. He said if she's caught in the act, maybe immorality I be. This is not to encourage anyone. In fact, the Bible said if you sin, the sin of immorality, you are sinning against your own body. That means you are putting your body at risk. You are putting your body at what? At risk. Now, this is not to encourage anybody to... Um, to go into the sin of immorality. But the things we count as sin are immorality, stealing, lying, and what else? Stealing. All those lesbianism, homosexuality, all those popular sins. But are you aware that covetousness is a sin? What is covetousness? I look at Bro Stephen. I look at his shirt. Set and his hand. So this shirt is very nice. I wish it is me that owns it. And you are wishing you are the one who owns this thing, and you become envious of him. It's a sin. Are you aware that bitterness is a sin? You hold grudges in your heart against someone. You malign somebody before others because you are not happy with them. You say what you know is not right because you want other people to see that person in a bad light, the way you are seeing them, is a sin. That one, no one will easily catch you in the act, but you are sinning. The reality is this. If God has to judge the same thing that happens to the one who commits immorality, who stole, who robbed, who commits whatsoever we know to be sin. It's the same thing that happens to you. Because if God has to, if not for what Jesus has done for us through his blood, you will not be justified in the sight of God. So, the summary of it is this. If a sinner who is good, who is good, has no hope of eternity. Are you aware that there are some sinners who gives more than, to church, to churches, more than believers? The, the person that my twin brother in Lagos, Reverend Vitalis, the man they bought their land, the church landed property from, is an allergy. And he told him that he has his own pastor. He sent his tithe, sent seed, supports the, and he gave them so much favor that many Christians wouldn't have given. For example, let me give you two a comparison. The church, the building where they were using before was a leased place. Then the owner sold it without informing my twin. And he sold it to 
I don't want to mention the church, but they wear apron. I leave the rest to your imagination. He sold it to a member of that church. And they, their rent has not expired. They still had about a year ahead. And the person who bought it knew that they still have a year ahead. They were not willing to refund them their one year rent that is about. Instead, the person who is a Christian connived with the landlord. They went to the courts that he has bought the land and the landlord did not want to vacate it. So the judge, not knowing the, the details of the whole story, gave a judgment that they should go and flush out the landlord and whatsoever is occupying the property. Because the landlord came that he's actually sorry. Uh, he will have moved out. Uh, so, judgment was given. My twin was not aware. And they just renovated the place. They put new doors, installed ACs in the offices, put, bought some new equipment. They brought togs. Togs removed doors. They were carrying it away daytime. With police so, watching over them. Their equipment were vandalized. When they sent for my twin, they go, what happened, what happened? They said, we bought this place, you don't want to leave. They said, ah. He started trying to call the landlords. The landlord's number was not available because it was but a Christian planned that with the landlord. Now, fast forward. They were able to move into another rented hall. They were there for three months. They were paying one million naira every month as at that time. And God supernaturally provided. Now, they now saw two plots of land, which was very rare in that area. It now happens to belong to an allergy. To buy a plot that has an old building on it, building that is not useful, that you have to pull down, all these mud houses in that central type of Shomolu. As at that time, 33 million, 35 million. And you will still need to spend money to pull the building down and pay trucks to come and remove all the robots. They now got a place, empty land. So, and when the landlord heard that a church was interested, he stopped negotiating with the person that wanted to pay. He said he was interested in the church more than. So when they, they, passed, they started negotiating from 30 something million, he said, okay, if it is for church, you say you want to use it for church, he said, yes, okay, pay me 27 million. And I will allow you to pay instrumentally. Because it's for God. That he will not want to have anything against God. Now, that's an unbeliever, but that will not take him to heaven. Because he is not born again. Now, this is where I'm going. If what Adam did was so strong, that the only thing that can break it is the blood, the death and resurrection of Jesus. What makes you think that what Jesus did is weak? That so when the person falls into sin, his heaven is cancelled. If when an unbeliever does good, his hell is not cancelled. What makes you think? Am I, are we learning something? But you see, religion has messed up our mind. We have to look at what the Bible says and accept the truth. That is why so many Christians are still slaves to sin. Because they have no confidence in their own salvation. That's why let me say this to you before I conclude on that. Check how you became born again. If what you had on the day you claimed to be born again was they told you about hell, how hell is hot, how hell, and you are afraid you don't want to go to hell, that's what makes you now run to the front. You are not born again. There is only one criteria. 
Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. See, when you are genuinely born again, you will never be comfortable with sin. Never. Even when it looks as if you can't stop it. But the reality is that you are not, you are not happy with yourself. There is no genuine child of God who is comfortable with sin. That if you do what? Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and do what? Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So there must be a believing unto righteousness from your heart. And you cannot believe unto righteousness until you genuinely believe that Christ died for the forgiveness of your sin and he rose on the third day for your justification. It is when you are certain, you believe that what Jesus did is for you. And as a result of his death and resurrection, you have been forgiven and you have been justified and you have been reconciled back unto God. You are no longer a sinner. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ. When you believe that in your heart, something takes place in your spirit. Something takes place where? In your spirit. It was not a repackaging. It was not a... Re um, a renovation of your spirit. It's, it's, it's a recreation, regeneration. You became a brand new person. You look exactly in the spirit, exactly like God. Like God. So, God sees you through who Jesus is. Do you know, you can't be in sin and be in Christ at the same time. If a man be where? In Christ. So if you are in Christ, it is impossible for you to live in sin. I think this thing, are we getting something? Okay, okay. First John chapter... Three. First John chapter 3. Let's read from verse 4 to 9. Whoever commits sin, commits sin, also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Verse 5. And you know that he was manifested. Jesus was manifested. To do what? To take away our sins. And in him, in him, where you are, there is no sin. Do I have somebody who is in Christ here? Yeah. So where I am, there is no sin. Now, in answer, whoever abides in him does not sin. Remember the question of that person. Somebody who say, who is born again and still believes. Believing is what makes you abide in him. So whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Verse 8, he who sins is of the devil. That is the person living in sin. Check that as sins. Habitually sinning. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Look at verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now, in the sight of God, you cannot sin. Because he looks at you based on who you are in the spirit. Don't forget that when we were sinners, sin has trained our mind 
and our body on the acts of sinning. Let, let me say this to you. Many, many years ago, as uh, a young, I think I was around the first time I smoked, was I was around 19. What happened? My, one of my cousins was working for a newspaper distribution company, and they employed me to be a sales clerk. So my job was to sleep over in the office. So all the newspaper houses, they always bring their supplies between 12 a.m. and 4 a.m. In those days of Concord newspapers, Sketch, um, Tribune, New Nigerian, many, many newspapers. Now, when they, they bring the newspaper, my job was to receive the supplies from them and sign for them. And then I will now begin to, all our vendors already has given, they have fixed amount of daily times, so-so copies, number of copies, uh, punch, so-so number of copies, concord, so-so number of copies, sketch, so-so number of copies. And so I will start distributing all the vendors who have their names written on the wall, and we draw lines. So I will start arranging the... So before 5 a.m., when the vendors will come, everybody will have... We just meet their distant on the, on the ground there. And then the one they sold yesterday, what they call unsold, the one they didn't sell, I will collect it, record it, and give them a new one, and they will pay for yesterday's own. Now, the landlord's son happens to be a very bad boy, one of the sons, and he was my friend. As at that time, I was a very innocent young boy, very good, until I met that boy. He was in Yaba College of Tech. He told me that in Yaba Tech, as long as he's in that school, there will be no Bob anywhere in the school. He was stealing Bob. So he was the one who introduced me to cigarettes. I started smoking cigarettes. One day, he asked me to follow him to a party in the evening, in the night, that will come back before 12. I got to the party, and everybody was smoking Indian hemp. I was the only one not smoking, so they started mocking me. So I wanted to also <laughs> so belong. That's why the Bible says, if you walk with the foolish, if you walk with the wise, you'll be wise. He said the companion of fools will be destroyed. So as you are mocking me, I didn't like the mockery. Instead of me to carry my body, and return back to where they come from. I said, give me one wrap. I tried it. By the time I did the thing, the second or the third time, it's like my head wanted to fall from my head. <laughs> so I now held my head like this. He said, what happened? I said, Bill, I said, my head won't fall. <laughs> he quickly pushed me. He carried me back to the office. But I wanted to lie down. The ground was stunning. <laughs> Everything was, I was afraid. I said, I said, I won't die. Oh. I had to go back home. When I saw my cousin, he said, why are you, are you are not supposed to be in the office? I said, I don't know what's happened. You know, young people say, be like. I said, my head won't fall. He said, this boy, you are smoking, boy. <laughs> What am I trying to say? That's what sin has done to our soul. In the spirit, sin is a nature of the human spirit before the death and resurrection of Jesus. So because of that, he has trained the soul, the fellowship has influenced the soul and our body to behave in a certain way. That's why after your salvation, the most important thing for you is the renewal of your mind. 
what does that involve? To help you overcome the old way of thinking that sin taught you. So that you can now start thinking like the new creation that you are. That's why focusing on God's word should be your priority. So that your way of thinking, your, the way you see things, what will attract you, what makes sense to you, will now be in alignment with the things that make sense to God. Am I talking to somebody? So, God in his mercy and grace is not holding you responsible. Because what God wants to punish is sin, not the man. I think one day we have opportunity to talk about this. When you study the book of Revelation, you see that sin will be judged. The false prophets will be thrown into hell. Sin will be cast into hell. The death, grave, and the false prophets will be casted into hell. Now, the reason why unbelievers will go to hell is because they still have sin. The nature of sin in them. So if sin has to be judged, automatically they are judged. So for you as a child of God, that you no longer have the nature of sin, you can't be thrown into hell. I hope we have a good understanding. God bless you. Go back home. Listen to this thing. Listen to this, mess, this um, discussion over and over. And meditate on the scripture. It will help your understanding. Praise the Lord. The next question. According to Matthew 6, 5 to 7, we should not use vain repetitions. What does the Bible mean by vain repetitions? Let's quickly read that portion. Matthew 6, verses 5 to 7. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will do what? Reward you openly. Verse 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be hard for their many words. Now, get this. I've told us in this church over and over that whatsoever you do is as important, I mean, the motives behind whatsoever you do is as important as the things you do. You might do here the right thing for the wrong reason. If the motive is wrong, the actions will be wrong. Even though you have done what is good, but if your reason for doing it is wrong, it won't enjoy God's reward. Now, going back to the question, some people believe, for example, there are some People I know, some churches that, uh, um, when they say, especially those when they pray in Yoruba, they say, Lua, bo, that is God here. They say, bo, 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 here, here, hear me, oh, hear me, hear me, oh, hear me. That's what the Bible calls being repetition. Why are you repeating it? If it is because you think until you repeat it as many times as you can, God will not hear. Then it has become a vain repetition. Verses 5 and 6 that we read, is it wrong to pray outside? No. Why are you praying outside? Go back to that verses 5 and 6 because I need to address that too. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street. Motive, that they may be seen by men. 
Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. You fasted. You fasted. Nobody knew you fasted. But you've now frowned your face. They say, why is your face like this? This is fasting. It's no day easy. You have gotten your reward. That's why some of us fast, nothing they come out of it. Because you have sought for human applaud above the substance of your fasting. So when you pray, let it not be that people, everybody can say, ah, that sister can pray, that brother can pray, or let it not be that you are trying to show the rest people, say, see us, how we pray. You went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in your mind, let me show them how to pray. You have missed it. Pray your prayer sincerely from your heart, expecting God to answer you, not to impress any human being. Yes, thank you very much. So vain repetition is when you have to keep repeating the same word. It's very clear from that scripture because you have believed that if you no know, speak, repeat and well, nothing will happen. Praise the Lord. But don't forget that the Bible says, let, let, let's read the place. Matthew chapter 6. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Matthew chapter 6. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And are you aware that these are the things we get worried about? But Jesus said, don't be worried about them. He said, it's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. He gave you life. Is it not more than the food? And he gave you the body. Is the body not more important than the clothing? The person who gave you life, won't he give you food? And the person who gave you body, won't he give you cloth? Remember what he did to Adam and Eve. He knew he was the one who gave them the body. But they messed up. Yet he knew he had the responsibility to help them cover the body. Let's read on. Therefore, I verse 26. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bands. Yet your heavenly, not their heavenly father. God is not the heavenly father of the birds. But he is your own heavenly father. He said, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So why do you now need to, hey, Oluwa, go, 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 here, oh, here, here, oh, here. Listen, oh, listen. Look, look, go, go on. 27. 27. You have more value. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Verse 28. Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lily, lilies of the field, how they grow. They need us toil nor spin. Verse 29, quickly. I'm going somewhere. I want to show you somewhere. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of those flowers. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, that is today they exist, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Verse 31. Verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Verse 32. For all these things the Gentiles seek, this is what I want you to keep in your heart. For your heavenly Father knows that you what? Oh, oh, he's too quiet in this holy church. For your heavenly Father knows that what? You need all these things. Even though he asks you to bring them to before him in prayers, 
But he knew you need those things before he asked you to pray about it. So you don't have to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. Bo, bo, oh Lord, oh, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's no longer a prayer of faith. I hope it's clear to the person who asked the question. The next question. Sometimes last week, you said mercy can ensure the fulfillment of one's destiny despite errors and mistakes that can derail you. Correct. However, I also remember one of your messages last month hmm, where you mentioned the case of Elijah and how he was replaced in the place of destiny because of a mistake. Why didn't mercy help realign him why did he get replaced? Hear this. If you listen to that message well, I showed you that God showed him mercy, but he turned his back against mercy. Don't forget, they that observe lying vanities forsake. Now, when Jezebel, go and study your Bible if you are that person. When Jezebel threatened him, he said, I'm not better than my father's. And he left. He ran into the bush, into the forest. Now, God went to him there. Asked him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he started his ranting. Um, your people have turned against you. They have killed all your prophets. It's only me. I alone that remain, and they seek to take my life. And God said to him, eat first. He was given food. Angel, I don't know where the angel cooked the food. Angel, that's mercy. He knew that he needed, and it was not an ordinary food though. Because the Bible says he went in the strength of that for 40 days. I like that kind of food. How I wish we can have it. I eat today, 40 days, no food. I go, it is very good for Tinobu's economy. <laughs> uh. But God had to bring his back, his heart back to him. For him to return back to his real self, he showed him a quick uh, hail, fire, wind. The purpose of those things was to tell Elijah, don't be afraid of that woman. Even an earthquake you need to deal with him, I get him. If it is fire, I have it. If it is thunder, it's available. If it is wind, to just carry him and let him disappear into the atmosphere, I have it. After God has shown Elijah all those things, God asks him again, what are you doing here? Expecting him to have seen reason why he should not be afraid and run again. But he repeated the, whole, the same thing. In the process, he was actually testifying against the people of Israel. We saw that in the New Testament. He was setting God. He wanted to set God against them. The same people that he has brought their heart back to God. The only person whose heart, the only two people whose heart is not yet back to God was Ahab and Jezebel. But out of his Emotion, he said, the whole is strength. Hear me, church. If you allow fear, you will exaggerate your situation. Fear makes you to exaggerate your situation. When you focus on the problem, you will, over, you will exaggerate that problem. You will, you will describe it beyond what it is because you are looking for pity. God doesn't have time for that kind of pity. 
because it can solve any problem. So God actually showed mercy. It was when Elijah refused to accept the mercy of God, just like Job accepted. Study the book of Job. God, Job messed up because he started saying, trying to justify himself in the sight of God. Started saying so many things against God. I've taught us along that line before. When one of the things he said that even if he's right, Job said that even if he's right, he will have no mouth to declare his being right before God because God will intimidate him. I've read it to us several times. There's no time this night. But God in his mercy has to come to Job and spoke to him. He said, who is this that is talking without sense? And God began to outline things. And eventually in Job chapter 42 from verse 1, Job said, you asked when you started talking with me, who is it that is talking without knowledge? He said, I'm that person. He said, now I can see my foolishness. He repented. He embraced mercy. And everything turned around. God showed mercy to Elijah, but he was too carried away by his emotion. He was too concerned about himself. You know, he was used to enjoying celebrity status. Everybody flock around him. Everybody rallied around him. He stand, declared things, and it happened. It has never occurred to him before that his ego could be bruised. So when it happened, he was deflated. It shows, with all humility, I dare to say this, it shows some level of pride in the life of Elijah. So God had to, you know, I tell people who say, uh, some Yoruba, this thing, uh, they, they have a song. That is, the way the chariot carried Elijah, that is, you carry them. I say, I don't like that. I would rather prefer the way Jesus was taken. Read that thing very well. Do you know these things that, um, what do they call it? Well wind. It was well wind that carried him, not chariot. The chariot came, but he was not in the chariot. It was well wind. Go and read your Bible well. It was well wind. If well wind carry you, it's not comfortable. Because he had to go to heaven prematurely. Am I talking to somebody? So God showed him mercy, but he turned his back. God is ever merciful. May you not consciously or unconsciously turn your back against the mercy of God. That's why don't get carried away by what you are going through. Don't allow your situation to make you exaggerate and make you to begin to see things that no matter what the word of God says, you are not hearing no matter what God is trying to do, to get you back on track, you are not seeing it. May you not find yourself in that situation. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So, to that person who asked that question, God showed him mercy, but he turned his back against mercy. The next question. <laughs> by by 7.30... Every other question will be shifted to so that we can pray. According to Acts chapter 2, talking about Pentecost, that when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will speak in other tongues. While the disciples were speaking in tongues, the people were able to understand what they were saying, which means there was an interpreter. No, there was no interpreter. Why is it that nowadays, when pastors are praying in tongues, there is always no interpreter? Uh -huh. Thank you. The, perhaps this person has not been to foundation class. 
That's why we all should go through foundation class so that you can get certain. Let me tell you this. There are different kinds of tongues. There is speaking in tongues. There is praying in tongues. When we stand here, what we do is praying in tongues. Let, let me, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. For he who what? Speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to who? But to God. That's why. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks what? Okay. How will it look like? I just, this coming Sunday, and I just climbed the altar, and I said, Rika Tuata. La keswa zadira kosha kuwaka teliando karuna. Mazina nahazia. Jaku jaku. Riko talianda kuka talianda kaaza. Maika! What will you be doing? <laughs> So in such instance, I need an interpreter. Speaking in tongues is like preaching. But when you are speaking, you are saying mysteries to God. Let, let's quickly read through that First Corinthians chapter 4. You will get the clear answer. Verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. That's what our message does. Our messages are like prophecies. Verse 5. I wish you all spoke with tongues. They post me. Verse 5. Oh. Okay, I've not read 4. He said, okay, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. That's why when you are speaking in tongues, that's why you have to trust God to be able to speak in tongues. Because when you are alone in your room, you speak in tongues. You are speaking mystery. The devil is confused. He doesn't know what you are talking about. He doesn't know. See, when you pray in understanding, he's looking at how to stop the answers to your prayer by creating doubt in your heart. But when you pray in tongues, he doesn't know what you are praying. You don't know what you are praying. You can't doubt it. And he cannot provoke you to doubt it because you are speaking mystery that only God alone understands. Go back. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So when you are speaking in mystery, you are being built up. To be edified means to be. But he who prophesies edifies who? The church. So when I teach, and I speak over us, I am building us up, helping us to grow in faith and understanding. Verse 5. Verse 5. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy, that is for the sake of standing and becoming a blessing to the church. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. Why? Unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So pray, speaking in tongues edifies you. But when I speak God's word to you, I declare God's counsel to you, I am edifying you. You are being built up. There are many of us. When you came into this church, you knew how your life was. But as you are receiving God's word, you are being edified, you are being transformed, you are changing. You didn't even know when you are changing. You just found out that at the time, ah, the things you used to do before, you are no longer doing them. The wrong appetite, the appetite you used to have for sin, gradually they are dying. Some wrong attitudes that you are battling with, somehow they are disappearing. You didn't even know how, but you are just changing. That is what the word of prophecies, teachings, does to you. 
Go back. Let's quickly. So, but, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Unless I speak to you either by revelation, can you see that? By knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. Verse 7. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what is piped or played? That is, if I come here, I'm just speaking in tongues. You can't, dis you can't uh, decipher the things I'm saying. You don't understand what I'm saying. So it's of no benefit to you. So the tongues with the pastor speak is not, we are not speaking in tongues, we are praying in tongues. Quickly, go back. For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Verse 9. So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. Take note, speaking in tongues. Verse 10. There are, it may be so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Verse 11. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks. And he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. So if I'm just speaking in tongues to you, we are like foreigners to each other because you don't understand what I'm saying. Verse 12. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Verse 13. Therefore let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. In the early church, there are times where they had to speak in tongues and God will give somebody, another person the gift to interpret. So as the person is speaking, um, Somebody will be interpreting. And in some cases, the person speaking in tongues will interpret it by himself. There are times I've spoken in tongues and I instantly knew the interpretation of the story, especially when it had to do with a prophecy concerning me. So there are different kinds of tongues. Speaking in tongues, there are tongues of angels and there is praying in tongues. So praying in tongues is what we do here in the church. So when you hear pastors, Rikato, Majeka, Tuala, Itrabori, Anda, he's not talking to you. He's praying. Praise God. And since it's not you, he intends to talk to, there is no need for interpretation. And if there is need for any of those things to be interpreted, God can give him the interpretation. You see, one of the reasons why today as churches, lots and lots of pastors do not actually encourage the interpretation is that it has become the reason why some church is scattered. I won't, I won't, I will quote it. That is a church. They believe in the tongues and interpretation. And they, were, they encouraged their members. Because he just wanted to operate the way it was in the... Until one day he was... Somebody was... Started speaking in tongues. And... An interpreter got up and he said, the Lord is saying, I am the wife of the servant of God that is speaking. Then another person received, I'm telling you the truth of what happened. Another person received interpretation and said, let no one lie in this place. <laughs> That you are not the, you are not the wife.
and she pointed to her own sister. <laughs> they were both. The pastor said that was when he began to think about. He said he tried to correct it, but he saw that they entered into a lot of problems because of wrong interpretations. So he, he stopped that activity. There are a lot of people in the church, they are not matured for certain things. And if you expose them to it, they will create more problem than add value. Praise the Lord. So, the summary of it is that um, Jude verse 20, Jude verse 20, to confirm that praying in tongues is about building you up while speaking, I mean, Jude, 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 not Judges. Jude, J-U-D-E. Oh, you want me to call it in Yoruba? But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Doing what? Praying in the Holy Spirit. That is praying in tongues. Praying in tongues helps us a lot. It helps us to pray about the things that your understanding cannot comprehend. Speaking in tongues is what needs interpretation. Praying in tongues. So, the summary of it is that if you have not been, I mean, if you have not gone through the foundation class, please, I beg you, because one of the things we want to insist in this church now, we have been doing it, but it's like, I don't know, my people um, relaxed it at a time. If you have not gone through foundation class, you are not permitted to be a worker. Because certain, you need to have certain biblical understanding. And that's why a lot of people misbehave. There are a lot of people who don't know the importance of stewardship. They don't know the, 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 the need to know how to follow. You are not a good follower. You are, can never be a good leader. You must first of all learn to be under authority before you can become an authority. We are going to stop here. 7.35. The rest questions, please, media, take note of the ones we have not answered. We will answer them on the last Thursday of the month. So if you have any questions before then, please, you can walk up to the resident pastor, Pastor Dupe, or assistant resident pastor two, Pastor Dan, and submit your questions to them. God bless you. Are we blessed tonight? Can we rise up on our feet? Can we lift up our voices and give thanks to the Lord? If you have learned anything here tonight, appreciate the Lord. Appreciate the Lord. Appreciate the Lord from the depth of your heart. May they give me 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. Thank you, Father. I want you to pray one prayer. It doesn't matter what you have done wrong. 
in the past, the effect of it will not hinder God's plans and purpose for your life. Let me, for better understanding, let's read that scripture. This is strong in my heart that we should pray about. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I what? Obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in what? In unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Go on, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You know, each time I look at that, uh, say, I am. In other words, it was real. And the effect of it can still be seen. People are still talking about what he did. That's why he used the word, I am chief. Among sinners. But look at verse 16. That's where I'm going. Verse 16. However, <laughs> for that same reason, for the reason of all I've done wrong, because of all that I've done wrong, I obtain mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. In other words, if in spite of the wrongdoings of Paul, he enjoyed the mercy of God and he finished well. It doesn't matter what you have done wrong. It's a pattern. As a pattern. Give me that verse 16 from another translation. Let's read it from different translations. Then you are going to pray. Your yesterday will not stop your today. And it will not hinder your tomorrow. But I obtain mercy for the reason that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might show forth and display all his perfect long suffering and patience. For an example, that's pattern, to encourage those who would thereafter believe on him for the gaining of eternal life. That means whatsoever you have done wrong yesterday should not stop the fulfillment of God's plan for your life. Give me Message Bible. Of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. And now he shows me off. Evidence of his endless patience to those who are right on the edge of trusting him forever. Hey, not too long from now. Someone under the sound of my voice, you will be the showpiece of God's goodness. Your life will be a showpiece of God's favor. Your life will be a showpiece of God's mercy. In the name of Jesus. Good news. I want you to have you understood that when you pray just for three, four minutes, Pray it from your heart. But God was merciful to me in order that Christ Jesus might show his full patience in dealing with me, the worst of sinners, as an example for all those who will later believe in him and receive eternal life. Don't give up on yourself. Oh. You are not getting it right. Don't give up. Stop looking at somebody say, eh. Me, I'm not getting it right. That person is just walking with God beautifully. How I wish God is patient with you. Leverage on his patience and his mercy 
and allow him to finish his good works in your life. Refuse to see yourself the way the world wants you to see you. But God was merciful to me in order that Christ Jesus might show his full patience in dealing with me. The worst of sinners. Look up, church. I'm very certain in my heart that there is none of us under in standing here that has done worse to the church than Paul did. Whatever you think you have done to people, it can never be compared to what, what Paul did to the church. Yet God was patient. Patiently endured this until he arrested him at the right time. Now you have been arrested for him. How much more will he now help you to overcome all the temptations, all the trials? And what is meant to be a repercussion, he turned into testimonies. I have that assurance, trusting in his mercy, that if your amen is strong enough, in the name of Jesus, your errors of yesterday will no longer count against your future. In the name of Jesus. Lift up your right hand and say after me, Father, in the name of Jesus, trusting in your mercy, I ask, O oh Lord, that after the order of Paul, help me, O oh Lord, by your mercy, that my errors of yesterday will no longer count against my future, will not walk against my destiny. In the name of Jesus, let your mercy speak for me. Let your mercy answer for me. In the name of Jesus, lift up your voice and turn it to prayer. Jesus, As I wish somebody can pray that prayer. Lord, trust in your mercy, O oh God, in the order of Paul. Lay your mercy, O oh God, speak for me. That my errors of yesterday, O oh God, will no longer be counted in my life. Shaka keta kaka taka shkate koka katia kaka baraka tela kara sheke koka katia kaka balhatera do a quick walk by your mercy in my life that my errors of yesterday's will no longer be counted will no longer be spotted will no longer be seen ekopre katika kopa kashka shift up your voice and begin to pray every wrong seed I sowed yesterday today that ought to produce evil fruit in my life father let your mercy answer for me let your mercy answer for me in the name of jesus let there be a turn around in my favor just as you did it for apostle paul do it for me oh lord in the name of jesus let the voice of your mercy sound over my life speak over my destiny in the name of jesus that the mistakes of yesterday will not bring sorrow for me tomorrow. In the name of Jesus, will not bring pain for me tomorrow. Lift up your voice and pray. Lord, by the sound of your mercy, Lord, let the errors of my past, oh God, never speak in my tomorrow. Just like you did it to Brother Paul, Lord, do it in my life, oh God. Because of my past will not be traceable in my future, in my today, in my tomorrow. Sand over me the voice of your mercy. Sheko katia katabala hatara. Sheke ko katika kabala hatena. Shaka kakatia kakabahatela. Sheke kevele kia kakabahara. Sand over us, oh God, the voice of your mercy. That the voice of your mercy will wipe out, oh God, every errors of the past. Ayeke tia katabahara. That the fate of those errors will not be seen in our today, in our tomorrow.
Lord on the days of our life. Sheko kakatika kabahata. Shianda katobarahatiaka. Afeleke kia kakabahatiala. Sheko kakatika kabahatara. Shabalaga gada kabarahatela. Sheka kakatika. Lift up your voice and say, Father, every of my wrong decisions of and actions, every wrong decisions and actions I made yesterday that ought to be a hindrance in my future. Father, let your mercy overturn it. Let your mercy turn it around in my favor. In the name of Jesus, let every consequences of my wrong actions and decisions, let them be wiped off. Let them be removed. In the name of Jesus, lift up your voice and turn it to prayer. Every wrong decisions of my action, Lord, let your mercy turn it over, oh God. Shake it, kia kaka bakatela. Shake it, kia kaka balakatara. Aye kaka bakatia katara. That the fact of my wrong decisions, shake it, kia kato brakatawa. We be torn by the voice of your mercy. Shake it, kia kato brakatala. Every wisdom I've engaged in the past that has brought me, oh God, to where I am. Shake it, kia kaka balatara. Let the multitude of your mercy turn it around for me. Shaka katela katala. Shake it, kia kaka balakat. Shabalaka kabara katela ba, shateke kia kaba tara, shaka katela kaya, sabere katia kaba tara, sheka kakati katala hata. Whatsoever you are going through now, that are consequences of your errors, that are consequences of your mistakes of the past, by the mercy of the Lord. I declare your situation overturned supernaturally. Let it turn to you for testimonies now in the name of Jesus. The voice of mercy speaks over your life. The voice of mercy speaks over your speaks over your health. The voice of mercy speaks over your children. The voice of mercy speaks over your ministry. The voice of mercy speaks over your businesses and your career. The voice of mercy speaks over your marriage. In the name of Jesus. Let all things begin to work together for your good. Nothing work against you anymore. That the God of mercy will be glorified in your life. Thank you, Father. Because we know you have done it. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody's amen should be the loudest. Amen.